carried that controversial claim that we send £350 million a week to the EU, money which could be spent on the NHS. Well, Remainers now have their own bus touring the country with a big number on the side of it. And it's in Liverpool today. And on board is campaigner Phil Richmond. Phil Richmond, haven't we had enough of buses with big figures on the side of them? Um, I don't know. I mean, we had a bus that said £350 million was going to uh, be saved by leaving the EU. And then the government's own figures show that, in fact, we're going to be £2,000 million a week poorer. And we understand why they tried to keep it under wraps and why MPs are only allowed to go and look at these numbers in a special room with an invigilator if they leave their mobile phones at the door. Right, and behind you, oh, we've got three, Jacob Rees-Mogg standing behind you, Evil, which might be slightly worrying from your, from, your, <laughs> from your perspective. They're obviously not very keen on your bus, but we'll leave them there in the background um, just to remind uh, viewers of his position. Um, Phil, isn't this all a bit late? Two years too late, in fact. Shouldn't you have done this during the referendum campaign? No, absolutely not. It's, it couldn't be a better time. We've had a sort of phony war for 18 months. And finally, the government is having to come uh, to admit that there are hard trade-offs in Brexit and that it's going to come at a price and that it's not going to make us better off, that we're going to be poorer. And we know how much poorer we're going to be. And we're just at a point where people are asking, is it worth it? We now can see what the price of Brexit is going to be. And what our campaign is doing is saying, is it worth it? And more and more people are asking, is it worth it? Now, why and how have you calculated that figure on the bus, which is being obscured slightly by the trio of Jacob Rees-Mogg's? OK, um, well, it's, uh, it, it's a pity they can't see the figure. The, um, the, it's very, very simple. If you have 5% loss of GDP growth and you have um, a, G, a current GDP of £2 trillion, 5% of that is 100 billion and that's 2 billion a week or 2,000 million. It's as, it's as simple as that. Aren't you just There's reignite no assumptions, no calculations needed. Aren't you just reigniting Project Fear? Sorry? Aren't you just reigniting Project Fear? No. Project Fear is about um, frightening people with things that, 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 that might happen. This is simply telling people what the government's own thinking is. This is what the people, the best experts the government have, are telling them is going to happen with Brexit. Now, apart from the three behind you, how have the turnouts been to see the bus? Turnouts have been great. We've been welcomed <laughs> everywhere. I'm afraid you can't see the turnout because they're on the other side of the bus, where there are some very, very good speeches. Right, I see. Oh, right. Because of the noise of those, I'm finding it slightly hard to hear you. Well, look, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. Perhaps you should have a conversation with the uh, three guys behind you wearing the Jacob Rees-Mogg mask, uh, mask and see if you can persuade I will, them. As, as soon as I'm, I'm, I'm off air, I'm, go I'm going to ask them, you know, do you really think it's worth it? But thanks for having me on. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, earlier this week, a pro-Brexit group of economists okay. came up with their own assessment of the economic impact of leaving the EU. Julian Jessup contributed to that report from Economists for Free Trade. Vicky Price is a former government economist. Well, of course, we were all glued to the Jacob rees mogs weren't we, uh, behind there in that last uh, film. Julian Jessup, your model assumes a mass elimination of tariffs. Has any government minister or political party indicated they would unilaterally eliminate all tariffs? Well, not as such, but I think that's a reasonable approximation for where the government wants to end up, which is a situation where we have a comprehensive free trade deal with the rest of the European Union, covering both goods and services, and significantly lower trade barriers with the rest of the world. It's true that the government isn't intending to completely eliminate mm. barriers. Um, in order to make our assumptions, we always have another scenario where they only eliminate roughly half of them, and that still delivers a positive number. But whichever way you look at it, you do end up in our scenarios with positive numbers rather than negative. Right, but you've admitted that you don't think anybody has actually put that scenario forward, the first one. I mean, has any other country or bloc indicated they'd be interested in removing tariffs and non-tariff barriers to the extent that you'd like to see? Mm. Well, I think as a starting point, we have to model what the government is actually aiming to achieve. We can have a separate argument about whether or not 
this scenario is likely to, to be accepted by the rest of the European Union or the rest of the world. But the problem, I think, with the Treasury analysis is that it basically models three scenarios, none of which are actually government policy. And in particular, the one that uh, features on the bus is something that the government has pretty much ruled out as well. So I think it's important to look at a range of scenarios rather than prejudge the outcome of the negotiations that haven't even started yet. What do you say in response to that, Vicky Price? Well, it's interesting that they've come up with a positive figure in the medium to long term. And we are really talking long term here. And what is the medium to long term? Well, I mean, uh, like... You have 20, years. 2030 right. as, as mm. the period that you're looking at. And, but of course, you know, it could take longer for any positives to come through. And in the long term, as we all know, we're all dead. Uh, but the interesting thing is that they're not saying very much about the short term, which is likely to be very disruptive. I think even those economists who put this together accept that there are going to be issues in the transition from where we are to a free trade area in terms of eliminating trade barriers when others haven't necessarily done so, that's going to be very difficult. The second thing is that, of course, any trade agreement we may have with anyone else is unlikely to cover services. And quite a lot of countries that would like to talk to us about this, like India, would like in return to be allowed to freely mm. come and live here and work here. And, of course, it's something that the UK is never going to allow. Do you sign up broadly to the Treasury analysis in terms of the scenarios that they used to say that growth would be slower or the economy would grow less quickly um, in the future? What I sign up to is that if you remove frictionless trade with our major trading partner, after all, we still sell 45% of our goods and services to them, and services are very important. If you make that less frictionless uh, and you reduce, therefore, the ability to sell to those countries the way we did before, it increases costs, it reduces growth. And therefore, that in itself is a very good starting point. Anything you do to reduce the the, the uh, impact you may have, in other words, anything that allows you to stay as close as you are to where you are at present would, of course, mean that you're not doing as badly as you would otherwise do. Right. I mean, do you agree that you are talking about the medium to long term? And if we are talking about 15 years mm. of slower growth or a smaller economy, that 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 is something that is going to impact negatively on the British public? Well, as far as the short term is concerned, of course, the Treasury published a report two years ago suggesting that a vote to leave would prompt an immediate recession. So I think our track record on predicting the short term is pretty good. Right, but what, is your, may, well, but what is your prediction for the short term? Well, we're not making, in this report, a prediction for the short term. I think a lot will depend on a couple of things. One, for example, is what sort of transitional arrangements are, are made. The second is what sort of adjustment mechanisms are put in place. For example, to protect agriculture if we're going to remove agricultural subsidies or, or manufacturing sectors where there may need to be retraining. Um, but those are in the short term. And you know, if we're looking at the longer term, once those adjustment costs have been worked through, would expect a big positive. Uh, right. I mean, what about the cost to consumers of Brexit? Because there are now, or there have always been, these two different positions. We heard Jacob Rees-Mogg um, saying that actually if we don't have a clean or pragmatic Brexit, the term that he'd use, uh, the cost for consumers will actually go up. But one of the main benefits of being in this huge uh, regional free trade area has been that, in fact, consumer prices have been kept low. Uh, we have now inflation finally reappearing, mainly because of our exchange rate having gone down. But overall, we've had a period of very low inflation. Uh, we have no tariffs. Uh, the trade barriers are practically non-existent, which means actually there are no costs to industry. And when you make, I mean, the EU's uh, benefit is that it has forced firms to um, take advantage, if you like, of economies of scale to take advantage of the fact that you can now move things easily from one country to another, take advantage of the fact that there's open skies and airline costs sure. have gone down significantly and so on. The consumer has been the main beneficiary of being there. On the other side, obviously, and I think that was the point that you were trying to Well, ask. the common external tariff has yes. meant in Jacob Rees uh, yes. Mogg's mind, whether it's right or wrong, that actually clothing and some food is more expensive. Oh, well, it's absolutely true that there are tariffs against various countries and various uh, products uh, that keep some prices high, but that's compensated significantly significantly by the low prices we pay for other things. And there is no expectation that we're going to be reducing those tariffs to zero or, or, or considerably, because that would basically eliminate our agricultural sector. It would probably eliminate our manufacturing sector too. And I think overall the consumer at the end of the day would suffer because of lower growth and lower and higher unemployment. Do you accept that the, the compensation outweighs the model that has been outlined by Jacob Rees-Mogg or do you agree with him completely? Well I, I, on this matter at least I, I'm with Jacob. I think the, the key point here is that a lot of the things that are being modelled are actually completely in the hands of the government. So when you get a big negative it's often because you assume that in the absence of a deal the British government would impose tariffs on import from the European Union. 
In practice, it could maintain the level playing field required under the rules of the, WTA, the World Trade Organization by lowering tariffs on trade with the rest of the world, which would be a clear positive. Now, there will be winners and losers from mm. this, but the winners far outweigh the losers, and it's possible to compensate the losers, losers and still be better off. Right, OK, well, let's have a look at the idea of compensation, because if, you, if we go back to the Treasury analysis, for mm. a free trade deal, for example, with America to make up for lost trade with the EU, then those civil service estimates and economists will not just have to be wrong, they'll have to be wrong by a factor of 40. Um, you know, for the estimated 0.2% growth from the US trade deal to make up for the lost 8% in trade from the EU. Do you accept that? I, well, I think both those numbers fail the common sense test. I mean, our, our exports to the EU are only 12% of GDP, and it, somehow the, the hit will be as much as 8% if we have even a relatively small increase in friction. Okay, well, that's what I'm saying, but it, we're talking about wrong by a factor of 40. I mean, do you accept that that is still quite a, a, a large measure to be wrong by? Well, if you look at the past track record of the Treasury in forecasting, then it seems quite reasonable to forecast that sort of error. Well, and on that, Treasury forecasting has not been accurate. It has not got a good track record. Um, and it is true that economic Armageddon was predicted in the immediate aftermath of that referendum vote, but it hasn't been realised. The first thing I would say that Treasury forecasting, if you look back through the years, has not been bad at all. In fact, there many times have been considerably better than the independent forecasters. The second thing is, of course, we haven't left... Uh, the EU yet. Brexit hasn't happened and also there was a huge uh, increase of liquidity into the system by the Bank of England and lower interest rates and quantitative easing and special help for loans to enterprises and consumers. They've all benefited from that and that's why the economy has kept going plus of course the fall in the pound. So there have been temporary factors. What's going on right now is that whereas the rest of the world is growing very fast, we're growing at the lowest rate of the G7. Before I come to our other guests, um, Julian Jessup, you claim that border costs would be zero. I mean, is there any border in the world where costs are zero, except the borders between countries of the single market? OK, to be precise, that is a, what we call a modelling assumption. Right. We're assuming that... A bit like the Treasury are, one. Exactly. It's, a, it's, it's an <laughs> assumption. But I actually think it's more reasonable than the Treasury's assumption, because well, over, time, over time, border costs are falling, for example, because of technological progress. It's increasingly easy to move goods across borders without having to face large costs. And we see that not just in the UK, but worldwide. In contrast, the Treasury is forecasting that there will be a big increase in border costs and a very substantial knock-on effect from the amount of trade that we're doing. So, as it happens, if you did add in a small amount back into our modelling for border costs, you would still produce positive results. But, ironically, our assumption, I think, of zero border costs is actually more accurate than what the Treasury has got. In terms of the effect on voters, mm. the economy wasn't necessarily the main issue for many people who voted leave. These discussions, um, important as they are, will they have an impact, including the amount of money that's been printed on this bus saying Brexit's going to cost 2,000 million, actually affect what people think? I doubt they will in the short term because I, I don't think the problem with the arguments made by the Treasury at the time of the referendum campaign was people simply didn't believe those numbers. They looked at the, I sat in on a focus group and they looked at that, mm. was it 4,300 a year we were gonna, all going to be worse off? And they looked at it and they didn't, um, didn't believe it and they didn't really understand how it related to their real lives. But people and, quite like 350 million going to the NHS. Well, that seems simpler because they know that we make a direct financial contribution to the EU. So I, I, I doubt, I think people generally will be sceptical about economists forecasts and, and the fact that we didn't drop into a recession immediately after we voted to leave it, it will emphasize voters general suspicions but about whether they can trust these numbers which seem spuriously precise always don't they Tim one of the problems is that neither side certainly on the extremes is is seems to be keen to give way in in any sense to the other argument um, is there really a view that there'll be no economic downside to brexit I've not encountered anyone privately or publicly, who said that, in the short term. Right. In the short term. The Brexit argument, the pro-Brexit argument, is that, first of all, these forecasts have been somewhat called into question by the, uh, the lack of severity of the impact of the vote result, because we were told it would be much, much worse than it really has been. Britain's fared fairly well. The second argument is that if you leave the EU and positively embrace global trade, 
Obviously, if you just simply sit on the margins of Europe and, and beg to be allowed back in, that probably won't do much for growth. But if you positively leave it and start trading more with East Asia, trading more with, with America, then that is actually going to create a growth which can make up for anything that's lost with Europe. And the other thing that has to be mentioned is technological change. One reason why it's very difficult to make economic forecasts of, of medium or long-term length is because you can't predict things like the internet or AI, things like that, which are going to dramatically change the kind of markets we're operating in in 10 or 20 years' time. All right, we'll have to end it there, but thank you both very much.